Welcome to BP Online. We're a church that meets in North Central Calgary with people from all over the world, from all different walks of life, and we're excited you're joining us today. We hope that as you watch online, you're encouraged and challenged in your faith, and most of all, that you encounter Jesus. If you're checking us out for the first time, welcome. You're in the right place at the right time. Whether you're watching us at home or on the go, we hope you'll be impacted by the service today. Thanks for joining us. We will be starting in just a few moments. We begin with some worship this weekend. Everybody, 
Who here is warm in Jesus' name? <laughs> it's freezing out there, amen? I'll just say what it is. It's freezing out there. If you're watching at home, you're probably pretty warm. We're so glad that you're here, right? That's the prayer for this weekend. Awaken our soul, right? If you're falling asleep, go outside for about four seconds and you'll be wide awake, okay? And that's what we want for our spiritual life. It's just to be awake to whatever it is that the Lord has. And we have eyes that see and ears that hear and hearts that respond to whatever it is that God is doing. I believe he's going to be doing something for us this weekend. Pastor Mark's talking about uh, the prayer of the altar, the altar prayers. And it's going to be really great. We're going to take communion. If you don't have your communion elements, you can go and grab them. If you're watching at home, grab a communion element. Grab a little cracker and a juice. I'm just going to pray and ask the Lord to awaken us today. So, Lord, I thank you. This is the day that you have made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad. No matter how cold it is outside, we're so thankful for your son. Lord, dying on the cross has set us free, and we want to celebrate that freedom. So I pray, Lord, as we worship you, as we sing songs about your goodness and your glory, that you would awaken our soul to, Lord, to that truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
love that. Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? Amen? And all things are possible. This, this is from the scripture from Ephesians. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. The way that that song starts off is that sometimes we forget that the Lord is for us and not against us. We forget sometimes the miracles that he has done in your life and in my life. I was just, as we were praying, I remember being 20 years old, stuck in the middle of nowhere, and my car was completely dead, and I was all alone and not dressed for the weather. And it was a lot like this. And I'm like, Lord, you got to turn this thing on. And through tears, there was a desperation prayer. I need you to start this car because I don't know where else I'm going to go. And just, and it started. I'm like, it's alive. I'll be alive. Lord, you're alive. And it was so fantastic. And I want us to pray those desperation prayers today. Some of those prayers that you have forgotten that the Lord wants to do in your life. He wants to see people healed in your life. He wants to see relationships stored, blessings restored. Lord, those desperation prayers, then who am I to deny what you can do? So there's times in my life where I don't pray it because I'm wondering if you won't. But Lord, today, and for every day forward, Father, I just pray that you would help us to have the faith that for Lord, for us to say that, Lord, even though sometimes I don't believe, I believe, as they said in that scripture. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Because who am I to deny what you want to do in and through our lives? And so, Lord, those tough prayers, those hard prayers, those desperate prayers, that maybe we stop praying, Lord, I pray that we would start in Jesus' name for relationships to be restored, to finances to be restored, to health to be restored, Lord, for jobs to be restored. Lord, I just pray that all things are possible. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to firmly understand that truth in faith so that all the praise can go to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I don't know what the Lord's got for us, but I'm just really pumped and I'm really glad that you're here. You are faithful because it's cold outside. So I'm thankful that you're here. Well, before you're seated, why don't you shake a few hands and greet those around you. Get to know the people that you're talking to. Our junior highs can go make their way into the uh, gymnasium. We have a couple quick announcements before Pastor Mark. It's Pastor Brandon here from BP Church. We want to welcome you to BP this weekend. If you are new, there is a connecting card in the seat back in front of you. And if you take a few moments, fill out as much information on that little connecting card as you feel you want to give to us. And take it to something called the Take 3 booth out in the foyer where we can put a gift in your hand, answer any of your questions, just welcome you, kind of show you around BP. So we're so glad that you're here. Also, if you have little ones in the sanctuary that aren't quite happy, uh, they may have a fantastic time in our nursery where you can take your child and drop your child off. You can be with your child. You can watch the service. You have to change your child. It's all there for you. So on behalf of BB Church and its staff, we want to welcome you to church today. Well, just a couple quick reminders. The first is that last week we handed out a 21-day uh, devotional for fasting and prayer. And so last week we started it off. If you haven't got it, we would love for you to grab it out in the foyer and take this next two weeks for prayer and fasting. The following week, uh, we're going to be opening up our church at 6 a.m. That's right. cock a doodle doo Want you there. Yes. Prayer and fat. cock a doodle doo <laughs> Yes! <laughs> don't think that because I'm 50 that I don't have reflexes <laughs> like a lynx. Yeah. Uh, from 6 to 7, we're going to be praying in the morning uh, to see what God has in store for BP and you um, for 2024. So mark that on your calendars. We'd love for you to take one of those days, if not all of them, and participate in our 21 days of prayer and fasting. 
And also at the end of the month, we're going to be hosting our Spiritual Enrichment Weekend. We have a guest speaker coming in from the International House of Prayer who will be doing all three of our weekend services. Plus, there's an additional one Sunday night. And we would love for you to be a part of that. Just really uh, dive deep and seek the Lord for 2024. So mark that on your calendars as well. Great ways for all of us to grow. Also, if you've never been baptized, we're going to be doing a baptism class at the end of the month as well. Uh, it's at 5 p.m. on the Saturday. And uh, from 5 to 6, it teaches you a little bit about baptism, what that means. If you said yes to Jesus, but you have not been water baptized, and you're like, I didn't know I had to, then we would love for you to take that course. Go to bpchurch.ca slash events, and you can register for that course and a lot of other things today. Hey guys, next Saturday, so January 20th at 9 a.m. here at the church, we're going to be having an open gym time where we're going to be playing basketball together. Coffee will be on. Um, even if your skill level is maybe not fully a fope level, but you're ready to come play basketball anyway, just come on out, enjoy a coffee together. We'd love to see you there. And the last thing that I want you to be aware of is that next weekend, we're going to be hosting something called an open house. So if you're new with us, uh, this is a great opportunity right after each service. So just go into the gym, see all of our ministries, meet all of our ministry leaders and pastors, and, and find ways that you can connect relationally, grow spiritually. It's phenomenal. We want you there because we really want 2024 to be a great year for you. And that's one way that you can kick it off. Well, church, those are all the announcements that we have for this week. We are continuing our series in building the altars of our lives. And today, Pastor Mark's going to talk about the altar of prayer. So at this time, we should put your hands together and welcome Pastor Mark. I thought that was going to go back and go in the other one. <laughs> that would have been cool. <clears throat> Well, welcome. We're glad you're here. If you're watching online, we're glad you're watching online. And, and for you that ventured out into this cold weather, way to go getting that car started. And uh, <clears throat> good job. Good job. We're going to try not to keep you too long so it'll still start when you go back out there because it's probably not plugged in. So, uh, But I want to, for a few minutes, I want to talk to you about altars of our life. Now, throughout Scripture, you'll see, especially in the Old Testament, you'll see different times when they create altars and altars were used for different things they were used for sacrifices they were used to commemorate things that God had done in someone's life and they were used as a place of worship and and they were they were a place to connect with God and so you can see this throughout scripture and in the New Testament we don't see it other than one place in the Mount of Transfiguration when 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 all of a sudden uh, Elijah and Moses show up with, with Jesus and they're praying and and the disciples say should we build altars for each of you and Jesus says no there's no need for that but the idea in, a, in our lives is that altars are important because they signify something that God has done or they remind us of something that God can do. And, and so when you look in the Old Testament or in, in Scripture at, at, at altars, they were God actually gave them specific instructions of how to build altars. They were to be built specifically out of stones that hadn't been carved. So they weren't, they weren't man's creation, but it was God's creation that was stacked up to commemorate what God had done. And so tonight before you leave, we're going to give you all a stone. Now, we didn't give it to you on the way in because I don't want anybody throwing stones. And don't give them to kids if you got kids on the way out because we don't want them throwing stones in the building. But uh, we're going to give you a stone. And this really is just a stone. Uh, but it's to commemorate times when God works in your life and to remind you the importance of that altar of prayer or that altars and the different altars in our lives as we connect with God. So I encourage you over these next maybe 21 days or actually 14 days now, you know, put this where you pray. And it just symbolizes God working. It's just a stone, not an idol, nothing like that. Just a stone. You don't pray to the stone. It's dead. It's just a symbol that says, you know what, God, I'm spending time with you. 
And God, God, I want to acknowledge what you've done in my life. I, I love the story of, of Joseph, not Joseph, uh, Joshua, uh, as he leads the children of Israel into the promised land. And as they go to the Jordan, it says the Jordan is at flood tides and, and it's flowing fast. And when they step into the Jordan, the Jordan separates and it says they cross, the entire nation crosses on dry ground. And when they come up out of the Jordan, they 12 tribes take out 12 stones out of the Jordan and they pile them up as a commemoration as a celebration of what God had done, that he had delivered them, that he had fulfilled his promise, that they were marching in by faith to take the land that God had given to them. And, and the stone stood there as a memorial to God to remind people of what God has done. Sometimes we, we forget how great our God is. Just like this last song that we sang. We, we lose focus on what God has done. And, and a lot of times we don't celebrate those memorials as it were of, man, God did this for me here. God started my car when it would not start. God, God performed a miracle in my workplace. God performed a miracle in my family. God performed a miracle in a relationship. Whatever it might be, but this is kind of one of those things. I, I encourage you, maybe you'll just put it on a mantle at home and it'll remind you that, you know what, I need to celebrate who God is and it also reminds you that God invites you to his altar he invites you to his altar we'll see this in Hebrews he invites us to come before him boldly with anticipation to make our requests known to him and so the altars of our life is what I want to talk about. And there's a few of them that I'm going to highlight. There's probably more that you could say. But uh, I just want to get your thoughts going in this direction. See, prayer is refreshing to us, but it's also a responsibility in our lives. It's not just meant for me. My prayer life is not just meant for me and my family and, and all those around me. But my prayer life is a responsibility to things in this world. Because we truly do want to see his kingdom come and his will done on earth as it is in heaven. And the way that that happens is through prayer. I'm going to talk about the Lord's Prayer next week a little bit. But today I just want to challenge you in prayer is not just for refreshing. But it becomes a responsibility in our life. And that's where these altars become a responsibility in our life to make sure that we create these altars in our life. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 2 through 6, we see one of the first altars uh, that is explained in Scripture. And it's Cain and Abel, these two brothers, Adam and Eve's sons. And, and Cain and Abel come and they bring sacrifices. And now Abel kept flocks and Cain who worked the field or worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits uh, of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering of fatter portions from some of the firstborn of the flock. Now, it's interesting here that God begins to, to show and speak into humanity about the importance of following what he desires versus what we want to do or what's convenient for us. He goes on, he says, uh, the, sorry, the, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. And the Lord said to him, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? You imagine having this conversation with God. You've done something and, and you were hoping that God would be pleased with it. But God says, no, that's, that's not what I want. It wasn't like God was correcting him in a harsh way. It was, Cain, Cain this is what I desire. You've done this. Thank you, but this is what I desire. And, and Cain is downcast. He's, he's mad about this. And the Lord looks at him and says, Cain, why do you look this way? And this is key for us to understand in our lives. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Cain, this is what I want you to do. If you do it, you're going to be accepted. It's good, Cain. Just follow through. He says, but if you do not do what is right, Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. I love that because the responsibility comes back on us. 
And when he looks at Cain and Abel, he says, you know, Cain, Abel did what I asked him to do. Or, or, or somewhere along the line, there must have been a conversation with Adam after the fall in the garden, after sin in the garden, of what it looked like to give a sacrifice to God. And, and, and Abel did what God had asked and what God required. But Cain didn't. Cain brought what he thought was good and his own idea of what he could do. But God said, no, that's not what I want. This is what I want. And Cain, you don't need to be upset. You don't need to be mad. If you do what I've asked you to do, everything will be good. But be careful because sin is always right there. Temptation is always around the corner. And it's always crouching at your life's door, waiting for an opportunity to jump into your life. But you must rule over it. You must take authority over it. And this is the first altar that we see. And, and, and we see a response in that altar is that, we are responsible for our own actions. And one of those altars that we make in our life is that personal altar. It starts with us, that we have to have a personal altar with God where we come to God on our own and we make a request known, yes, but we come to him on his circumstances, in his way, that we approach him through the grace that he's given to us. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, it says, and he said to all of them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus tells his disciples, if you want to be one of my disciples, then you need to die to yourself daily. Take up your cross daily and follow me. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul talking to the Galatians church, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life in which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't live my life just on my own, in my own way. I live my life the way that God wants me to live it. And I'm careful because I know sin or temptation is always right there. And if I give room for it, it's going to jump on my life. And so I take responsibility for my actions. And I come to God with that in mind that, God, I want to do it your way, not my way. Placing yourself on the altar is the first step. That I died of myself. God, it's you that I want to live my life for. I give you my life. You know, when we say that and we come into relationship with God and we say, God, I give you my life. He holds us to that. He holds us to that. You give you, you, I give you my life. Okay, well, if you give me your life, here's how I'd like you to live your life. And then in those moments, we live in obedience or we approach God on our own terms like Cain did and we try to do it our own way. And then we get mad at God because he's not accepting the way I want to live my life. And we hold resentment of, well, no, I, I want to do it my way. And, and all of a sudden, the divide becomes between us and God. The personal altar is the first altar. In John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, God gave... It, the, the story of Cain and Abel is an interesting story because we see where Cain falls into this trap of sin and instead of him just saying, Oh, God, forgive me, going and getting a, a calf from his brother and doing a proper sacrifice, what's he do? He allows this sin to come in and take over his life, and he kills his brother. So he holds resentment because his brother did what God wanted him to do, and he gets jealous of that, except, but all he had to do was say, oh, God, forgive me. And that's all we have to do in our lives is just simply go back to the altar and say, oh, God, forgive me. And he's faithful to always forgive. And then there's a community altar. So there's that personal altar first, and then, then there becomes a community altar where, where we are part of community and we create this altar with God. In Acts chapter 4, there's a great passage of Scripture there where, where the early church 
John and, and, and Peter, they've been uh, in the courtyard of the temple and, and there was an individual there at the gate that was begging, that was, that was lame. And, and they say, you know, we don't have silver and gold to give you, but what we do have you in Jesus' name, get up and walk. And he goes into the temple dancing and excited about life and God has healed his body and there's a big commotion about all this and, and the religious leaders then haul Peter and John aside and, and they correct, you know, they, they try to correct them for teaching in Jesus. Jesus name and 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 all of these things happen and they discourage them and say don't do this again and don't do any of this and so Peter and John leave that area and they go back to the rest of the apostles and disciples at the time and and, and when they get together they tell them all the things that the Sanhedrin had told them to do to stop doing this and stop doing this and stop doing this but you know what they did is they stopped and when they had prayed the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Well, everybody's got an alarm. Is there a hurricane or extreme cold, I bet. <laughs> okay. Power grid. I'm preaching too hard. That's draining the power grid. There's always sin encroaching at the door somewhere. <laughs> and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken. I love this because the apostles, uh, they were just going forward with what God is calling them to do. Now all of a sudden, community or, or, or the you know, society around them is pushing back at them saying, don't do this because we don't want you to do this or this isn't right for you to do. And, and they come back with the response of, well, what's better to do what you want us to do or do what God wants us to do? And, and, and they come together with the rest of them and say, you know, we're being, persecution is beginning to start against us. And, and, and they pray together and it's this community altar that's formed. They pray together, and when they pray together, the place was shaken, and it, they were filled with the Holy Spirit again. They were filled again. They were empowered again to move forward and do what God was calling them to do. You see, I believe that corporate prayer shakes the earth. I really believe that when we come together with a common purpose and we come together with a common goal and, and a common call from God that to do something and we, we gather around it and we grab a hold of it and God is calling us to do it, no matter what the persecution or what the pushback is from the rest of the world, when we agree together in prayer, God shakes the earth because it's his earth. He still owns it. He created it. And he knows what it takes to move things forward on this earth. See, corporate prayer encourages uh, each other and it builds each other up and it helps us to say, you know what? I'm not in this alone. I'm going forward. I understand you're facing some of the same challenges I'm facing, but we both have the same faith that God is going to take us through it. It encourages us to keep going together and to be obedient to what God is calling us to do. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 18 through 19, um, Jesus is uh, talking to his disciples here and talking about what it takes to move forward in this world. And he says, truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And again, truly, I tell you that if any two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done by my Father in heaven. There's a power in agreement. There's a power when two or three come together and they de declare together in Jesus' name that God shakes the earth. I believe that. But you know what? The easiest thing for the Satan to do is to stop you, not, not, not trying to dig at anybody this weekend, but to stop you from gathering with others to pray and make it a solo event. Because he knows you're a threat by yourself. Yes, you are. And in Jesus' name, you have authority to move heaven and earth by yourself in your own prayer closet. But he also knows that when you come together with others, you'll shake the earth. And it's so important for corporate prayer in, in, in ministries to exist and so important for corporate prayer never, never to be put on a back burner. There's seasons where, yes, you might have other things going on, but corporate prayer needs to be a primary altar of a church. It needs to be a primary altar of a community of people that love God. You see, pray the kingdom forward 
and you push back the darkness. That's what Jesus said. That what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in in heaven. You have the authority to push back darkness and to see the kingdom of God move forward on this earth. And then there's a miracle altar. And and there's times in life when we all need a miracle in our life. And we need God to show up and intervene and, and do things that we never could do on our own. And others can't do for us. And it's only God that can intervene in these circumstances. And there's there's a key to these miracle altars in our life when we remember what God has done. Now, Mark chapter 9, Jesus uh, is here with his disciples, and the disciples have been praying for an individual, and the individual they couldn't set that person free. And Jesus Jesus comes along and, and the individual that is there, it's his son. He says, you know, can you pray for him? Can you set him free? And, and Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. There's times in our lives where, yes, we believe God can do it, but we need help to believe he will do it. We know he can, but will he now? And we get in these circumstances in our lives and we need to dig down deep and say, okay, God, I know your word says this, that you are an all-powerful God, that you love me, you care about my life, you want to be involved in my life. I believe you can do it. I've seen you do it. And this is that altar of remembrance. I've seen you do it, but I'm believing you'll do it again. And it's that miracle altar in our life where we stop and we just say, God, I'm setting up camp right here until I see you move in this situation. I'm not going from this place until I encounter you. And he goes on, Jesus goes on. And when Jesus saw the people come running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit and said, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you to come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out and convulsed him greatly and came out of him. It's interesting on the other end of this, as this community, you know, as this miracle altar is, is, is seen here, on the other end of it, his disciples come to him and say, to him privately, why couldn't we cast it out? Why couldn't we see this miracle happen? And he said to him, this kind only comes out by nothing but prayer and fasting. This comes out by nothing but being ready to encounter that thing before you encounter that thing. And there's times in our lives, if we want to see a miracle happen, we need to be ready ahead of time. That's why it's so important to have this miracle mindset that you're ready for the problem before you see the problem. And to have that miracle mindset, you need to have that miracle altar activated in your life where you're taking time ready to be ready to deal with it before you know about it. And it only comes out by prayer and fasting. So that means prayer and fasting has to be a regular routine in our life if we're going to see some miracles happen. And in order for that to happen, we have to have a discipline of that altar in our life. We have to have that discipline that I'm going to be ready for even the hard things in life. And for our altar team, you know, that prays for people around the front, we challenge them to come here ready. Come here ready so that no matter what comes up, no matter what comes to the altar, you're ready to pray for these people. Well, that means you've spent some time praying and fasting before you get here on a weekend so that no matter what stands in front of you, you're ready to deal with it. But we need those altars in our life. If we want to see miracles happen, we need to be ready for the unexpected. And we create that miracle altar by prayer and fasting. See, faith is a key to that miracle altar. Believing that God will and God can and God wants to. And, and right now in Jesus' name, he will. But it's a, faith is the key to it. This individual says, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. And sometimes we're there. Help me in my unbelief. And that's, that's why it's so important sometimes when God does something miraculous, you know it and you see it, you hold on to that. You hold on to that. Maybe, maybe you write it on the stone. Maybe it becomes a mark on your stone, just a white dot or something, to remember that God is a miracle-working God and that all things are possible. All things are possible for him. 
And then there's a core altar. The core altar uh, is something I believe that every ministry needs to have, but every home needs to have. And if you're a leader in any area in life, you need to have a core altar. A core altar is your own <clears throat> prayer that has been the core of every leader. Prayer is a foundational thing for every leader, I believe. And if you're going to lead, you need to have a core altar in your life where prayer is a foundational part of everything you do. Now, and, and I say this and you say, well, yeah, I pray about everything. But sometimes we pray about things and then we jump into it in our own strength. And we need to understand the core strength that we have is not our own. It's not our own ability. It's not our own strategies. It's not our own will or whatever. It, it, it has to be a core altar that everything that I do runs through the filter of God's voice in my life. It's a core altar where God speaks first, not me. This is a challenge for us in life. That, you know, we will run into things because we have abilities, we have talents, we have gifts that God has given us and we'll rely on them sometimes instead of stopping and saying, God, I need you. When in reality, we think we don't. Because you've done it before. You've had a good result before. And you can run into that problem on your own strength. But we need to have this core altar. And when we build this core altar, I believe supernatural things happen in your leadership. A great example of this is in Exodus chapter 17, verses 10 through 13, where Moses is, is leading the army. Now, Moses is leading the army. Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. So Moses is in control. But Moses isn't down on the field. Moses is up on the mountain. And Moses is connecting with God on behalf of those fighting in the valley. This is an interesting thing. You might be able to get in there and get it done yourself. But you might have others around you that are able to get in there too. But somewhere in your family or somewhere in your workplace or somewhere in your ministry, you've got to be on the mountain talking to God while others are making things happen. Moses is on the mountain talking with God, and as long as he's talking with God and his arms are upheld, the army moves forward. When his arms go down, the army begins to lose. And then all of a sudden, these two individuals that are there with them, Aaron and her, they begin to hold up his arms as that support group to him. And as they support him in prayer and they support him on that mountain, as he's interceding on behalf of the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel wins the army, wins the battle. See, when Moses grew tired, they took care of him and they gave him that opportunity. You need to have a core altar in your life and you need to have other individuals interceding with you in that core altar. If you're married... You need to have your spouse as one of your intercessors, back and forth, both ways. If you're, if you're children, you know, if, if you're brother and sister, I encourage you to build that core altar with your brother and sister. Uh, whatever relationships you have, that you have individuals that come alongside you and, and, and they're just there to hold your arms up and you're there to hold their arms up to build these core altars in our own life that we realize I can't do anything without God and that I need God and that I need to share my needs with others that they can come alongside of me. We, we have, and I want to re resurrect this again, we have in our, in our prayer shield uh, where individuals are praying for the different pastors of the church. Now, we haven't worked on it in a year or two to make sure it's updated, so we're going to begin to update that again. And if you would like to be an intercessor with one of our pastors on staff or one of our staff members, we're going to ask you to begin to sign up for that again and, and just let us know who is, wants to you know, intercede on, on the behalf of, of, you know, it doesn't all have to be just for me, although I could use it all. Just, just saying, I, I need y'all. But it doesn't all, you know, Brandon needs intercession, Varel needs intercession, Fope, whatever it might be, we need you guys praying with us, holding our arms up in those times when we're tired, in those times when we're trying to do it on our own and we need to realize I need to stop and I need to tell somebody else about, this, about what I need right now. 
And I, and I want us to develop this a little bit better so that we're able to see God move things forward and have more victories than we've ever had before. Because I believe that's how it happens. Yeah, we can do things in our own strength, but there's nothing like the power of God. There's nothing like the hand of God. He can defeat the enemy in front of us without us raising an arm, spear, stone, whatever it might be. Spiritual battles often become physical battles. In this case, it was the children of Israel going into the promised land and the spiritual battle was to, to break down the enemy, which was Satan basically in the land and to cleanse <clears throat> the land of all of the foreign gods and all these other things that were there so that the children of Israel could have an opportunity just to worship God and not be distracted by other things. As they go in to possess the land, there's a spiritual battle going on and there's a physical battle going on. There's going to be a physical battle going on when you begin to touch things in the spirit realm. There's going to be things come at your life that you're like, what is that? Where did that come? Why is that happening to my, why is that person now mad at me? I didn't do anything to them. It's because you're waging a spiritual battle and there's going to be a physical thing that comes at you. I see it happen all the time. And you'll hear people sometimes say, well, man, I must be doing something right. It seems like everything else is going wrong. I believe that sometimes, but what the neglect to realize is when you're doing it on your own, you're going to feel that physical battle a whole lot more. But if you're doing it in relationship with others, that physical battle is not going to seem as big. So the children of Israel are able to defeat the Amalekites because Moses was warring on their behalf and Aaron and her were warring on their behalf in the spiritual so they could walk it out in the physical. So let me encourage you, have prayer partners. Have prayer partners in your life. Hebrews chapter four, verse 16 tells us, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may attain mercy and find, find grace to help us in our time of need, that we can boldly come to Jesus at any time. And the last one, the salvation altar. In our own lives, we have that relationship with God. We've laid ourselves, we have that personal altar in our lives. But then there needs to be a salvation altar where we're going after people that don't know Jesus. And we're bringing what we have to others that, that we have purposely determined in our life that we are going to see people's lives transformed. We're going to see people come into relationship with God, a salvation altar that you might say, well, I'm not an evangelist. You don't have to be an evangelist. You really don't. You just have to be obedient to God. That's all you got to do. You just got to live your life with an expectation that others need Jesus and others want Jesus and they're just waiting to receive Jesus. That's my mindset in ministry. Everybody wants to get saved. They just don't know it yet. That's because nobody's told them how great Jesus is. Once they understand who Jesus is and how great he is, why wouldn't they want Jesus? And that is that salvation altar that we bring. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16 through 17, for it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, the righteousness that by faith from first to last, <clears throat> just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith, that the right standing is there for everyone to understand and step into, that we need to have a, a, a salvation altar always present in our lives, that when we're talking with somebody and they're going through a hard time and they're facing difficulties, that one of the first things which should be in our heart is, well, you know what? I believe that God can help you in that. And they'll be like, yeah, that, yeah thank you. And you'll be, you'll, you might say, well, I'll pray for you. And they'll say, well, thank you so much. And you might even stop and say, well, I'll pray for you right now. And they, they'll be a little bit more uncomfortable. And they'll go, oh, okay. And you can pray for them right there. But then follow that up with, do you know who Jesus really is? And if they're like, well, no, that's all right. At least you dropped his name. Because you have an expectation and you have a salvation altar in your life 
that at any moment you can have somebody receive who Jesus is. And it's always in the forefront of their life. Uh, you know, we, we did up those spiritual disciplines uh, a few months ago, and we did those little folders. Everybody remember those folders? Yeah. So an uh, individual in our church took every one of those folders and took them to their work, and, and their boss said this was okay, and they put it in the break room at their work, all of those folders, all those different spiritual disciplines. And, and when they go into the break room, they can see these things have been opened and been read, and now all of a sudden there's all kinds of questions coming at them about what's in these booklets. That's a salvation altar. They, they've made a determination that this isn't just my workplace. This is an area where God has put me for ministry with an expectation of people coming to know who Jesus is. It's a salvation altar that they've built in their life that they're going to take everywhere that they go. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. I'm going to ask Pastor Ben to come back up. And, you know, as we close this weekend, I want to take the opportunity that we're going to do self, um, communion together. And hopefully you were able to pick this up on your way in. And uh, We build these different altars in our life. And they're all just different ways in which we pray and different opportunities in which we celebrate who God is. And the first is that personal altar that personal altar where we've accepted Jesus into our life. And if you haven't accepted Jesus into your life, I encourage you, we're going to stop in just a moment and ask Jesus if there's anything in our hearts that separates us from him and us, that we would just lay it down. Just like, just like Cain and Abel, that Cain had the opportunity just to simply turn and say, well, God, forgive me and let me give you exactly what you want. And he didn't. Right now, this weekend, no matter where you are, here in this room, watching online, that you can take that moment to stop and have that personal altar. That personal altar where you lay yourself on the altar again and you just say, Jesus, here's my life. Here's my life. I thank you for the forgiveness that you have for my life. So I'm going to ask you if you would to take this and, and to open it up and get the cracker out. The cracker represents the body of Jesus that was broken for us. And scripture tells us that by the wounds in his body, we receive healing. And that's that miracle altar. These are opportunities when we celebrate communion in church together. It's, it's an altar again of saying, God, I believe in all that you've done for me. I believe in your miracle working power. And that you allowed your body, Jesus, to be broken so my body can be whole. And in these moments, this cracker is just a cracker. It's just a wafer. But it's the faith in what this wafer represents that is the miracle working power of God. And so whether you're here or at home right now, if you're believing for somebody for healing, this is a symbol of healing. We're going to take it in as if we were taking in healing. And if you're in this room and you need healing or you're watching online and you need healing, as we take this cracker together, I just want you to stand in the promise that God is a healer and that God can heal, that he wants to heal, and he's going to heal right now in Jesus' name. And that together, as we agree together this weekend, I'm gonna, I expect to hear stories and testimonies of the healing power of God that works in someone's life, even as we just take communion. So I'm going to ask you to take the cracker and let's eat it together. Jesus, I thank you for your healing power. And God, we just stop right now. And for those that need a healing touch of Jesus right now, we just ask in your name that, Father, you would perform miracles right now. Lord, that you would bring healing, you'd bring restoration. Father, mind, body, and spirit right now, you would just heal and restore. This juice represents the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross, which is that symbol of an altar.
where he laid his life down as a sacrifice for my life. And Jesus challenges his disciples to pick up their cross and carry it daily, to lay down their life as he's laid down his life for us. Paul tells us that he's been crucified with Christ, so no longer he that lives, but it's Christ that lives in him. And when we go all the way back to the beginning and we look at, at Cain's and Abel's lives again, we look at Cain and he refused to listen to God's instruction for his life and he wanted to do it his own way. Now, let me challenge you right now to have that personal altar in your life where you allow God to speak into your life and into my life. And we say, God, what is it that you need to do in my life? What needs to change? What needs to, Father, conform to what you want it to do? in order that I can live my life to honor you. And let's just take a moment right now before we take this juice and just simply say, Jesus, is there anything in my life that's offensive to you? And if there is, show me right now. And if Holy Spirit speaks to something, just simply say, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, forgive me. Renew me. Wipe me clean. And Lord, we take this juice as a symbol of your forgiveness. It's just juice. It doesn't forgive us, but your blood does, Jesus. And it is a symbol of your blood applied to my life to wash me clean. So in Jesus' name, Lord, we accept your forgiveness as we take this juice today. In Jesus' name. Let's take it together. Let's stand and sing this song as we close this weekend.
So, Lord, I just come into agreement with individuals here, Lord, that have been pushing forward in the spirit. And they've seen things in the physical begin to come at them. And and things just seem to be falling apart around them as they're pushing forward in the spirit. Lord, I, I just lift up their hands right now. Lord, in Jesus' name, that you'll give them breakthrough. In Jesus' name. Lord, that these attacks of the enemy that have been coming at them, Father, we just bind those things. Lord, we bind them here, and they're bound in the heavens. And and Lord, so that they can walk forward in a confidence, in a confidence that you are on their side, and that victory is already theirs as they step into their future. So Lord, with all the attacks of the enemy, Lord, we just call them null, null and void. And, Father, that you'd put a hedge of protection around your people this week. And, Lord, that we could walk from victory to victory. And we would set up those memorials or those altars of praise, God, that would acknowledge your activity in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our ministry team is going to be here at the front. If we can pray with you about anything, we'd love to do that. God bless you. Have a great week. Stay warm. And uh, yeah, let the Lord use you this week to show somebody who he is. Thanks for watching. If you'd like more information about our ministry, visit bpchurch.ca. Have a great week and live the ultimate life.